to who was your coach that got the best out of you? Was there somebody that could get the best out of you more than somebody else? Because you seem critical. Like, even when you said, my daughter's got yellow belt, and he comes yeah. up and says, congratulations, <clears throat> just for what? You just gave it to them. They yeah. didn't earn it. That means you're pretty critical of weak coaches. Who did you have that really got the best out of you, and how did that person get the best out of you? Um, you know, this is the thing. I, I, my whole career, I pretty much, I, I taught myself. I never had a coach. So my coach was in, in my manager was in the corner not a coach. I had some classes, of course, with karate and all the way back, and I would say that karate guy, Roland Johnson, he taught me the perfect technique, how to do it and understanding the body mechanics. But from that moment on, once I started competing in mixed martial arts, I never had a coach. I learned the ground game myself. I never had somebody. I was just watching tapes and seeing it, and then I realized, wait a minute, I think I can make this better. And we just started rolling. Like, I lost my last fight by way of submission because, needless to say, I was a striker. You knock one, I knocked the first two guys out, third guy, yeah, he was not going to stand with me. Right, took me down, won by submission. He did. Then I won a few more fights by knockout. Lost again by submission. Then I felt won a few more fights, and then I lost again by submission. My last loss was against Ken Shamrock with a knee bar. <clears throat> and now it really started to piss me off. Now I go like because I'm I'm a sore loser, and I go I have to learn this game. Mm. So I stopped striking completely. I only did the tight pads, you know, to force stamina four times a week, and the rest two three times a day only ground. And what do you know? Suddenly I became obsessed with it. I mean, I became so crazy. I would wake up my wife in the middle of the night because I would dream a submission. I would put her in the submission and I would ask her where it hurt. Oh, swear to God. Come here, honey. I need to borrow oh, you yeah. for a second. <laughs> oh, okay, that one worked, babe. It's your shoulder, right? Yes, it's my shoulder. I would write it down and the next day Can I would we maybe go do it with our friend Are you, you being serious about this? 100%. This, this happened a bunch of times. She would walk in the kitchen and I say, lean over. And I would I go for a choke and say, "Are you getting dizzy, or does this hurt your throat?" She says, "I'm getting dizzy." Yeah, see, it's a blood choke, you know. So I, but I became obsessed with it. The whole house was a little post-its, but I never lost a fight anymore. You know, I lost my last fight by way of submission, and I won my next eight fights by submission. People were freaking out in Japan. They go, "What's That's going on?" Sick. Yeah, and one one of those eight was submission control. I didn't finish him, but the other ones were all seven finishes by submission. You see, but that's what I tell people all the time. You know, everybody can do this. You just have to do it. Like, I'm this guy. I'm super obsessed. I give this example always. Hopefully, it will spark something to some people. I was I was a karate guy, so my hands are here, right? And I start my first Thai boxing class. Well, I fought an A-class a, a guy, which is a professional guy. He realized really fast that if he would hit my head, I would overcommit with my, and I exposed my body. So I went down with a liver shot. That's where my love for the liver shot comes from, by the way. Because people always ask, where does it come from? My first Thai boxing class, the guy dropped me immediately. I went back home because my hands were here, and I stood three and a half, four hours in front of the mirror. I would uh, drink a cup of tea after 20 minutes, go back. And my wife at the time goes, you're insane. I go, no, that will never happen again. The next day I went back to the gym and I cleaned 85% of the gym out. And they thought I actually paid, played a trick on them, that I already knew how to box. I said, oh, I spent like three and a half hours in front of a mirror yesterday. You see, so when I see a problem that I have, mm -hmm. I want to fix it today. And if today is not going to work, it will be fixed tomorrow. I'm very obsessive compulsive for that kind well, of stuff. But, but that's, that's the point. So, so what, what just happened right there, that's, you can't teach that. That's what you can't teach. <clears throat> certain, when you're saying like who was born, who was you know, yeah. made, you cannot teach obsessive personality you cannot teach desire. Your desire can go higher by being around somebody that's got high desire. Your level of obsession can go higher by being around other people that are obsessed. But natural obsession, you either got it or you don't have it. I, at least that's my opinion from my experience. Yeah, but you know, I think it came from when I was very sick. You know, because I was, I wanted the biggest room in the house, yeah. which was the attic. Life changing really event. Nice. Yeah. yeah, but if I had an asthma attack, that was every five weeks, weak in bed, not able to eat because I couldn't breathe. So you can only imagine if I go down a flight of stairs, took me 45 minutes, but I had to do it. And that happened every five weeks. Mm. So I had to go down and going up, two steps, sitting down. Wow. <laughs> Resting two steps up, sitting down. You know, but that was pushing me, I think, to if I want something, well, now I know I have to work for it. So all that stuff that I had that I thought was a curse when I was a kid, it became a blessing. 100%. Uh, 100%. 100%. Because yeah. it's spark that's why I'm sitting here right now, because I got bullied and all the diseases. That's I want to I, I ask you a question done. about that exact topic right there. You said, you know, basically what you're saying, it's not the size of the dog in the fight. It's the size of the fight in the dog. You said at the beginning that when you were a kid, they called you the leper. Yeah. Right? Because you had a lot of health issues. You were bullied like crazy. 
fast forward, you know, 10, 20 years later, you're known as El Guapo. Yeah. The handsome one. Yeah. So I'm all about self-improvement. Just because where you're born in life doesn't mean where you need to finish. I feel like there's a lot of young men struggling today with, you know, whether it's career, whether it's purpose, whether it's women, whether it's money. There's a lot of young men struggling. And it sounds like you were kind of in that camp when you were a teenager. What are the big, not fighting, but what are the biggest lessons that you've learned life advice from being the leper and then turning into El Guapo? You know, finding out that it's done for a reason, you've been giving that by the Lord. He gave us, he gave me that for a reason. Once you understand that, because, so what is the reason there? Well, I knew the friends that I had were real friends, you know, because they didn't care about my skin disease. Now I had real friends, you see? So it always has pluses, you know? I was always by myself. I was always in the forest. I, I, had, I could climb the whole forest, treetop to treetop, swinging it over. Maybe five, six times I had to get out because it was too far. The trees were too far from each other. But that's where all my athletic ability started. You see, so everything, when you go back in time, you go, wow, it was there for a reason. So with all the craziness taking place, I believe future looks bright. If you believe future looks bright, get your latest future looks bright hat of value it says Future Looks Bright here, Future Looks Bright here. We got them in white, we got them in black, we got them in red. Our black on black sold out. These are about to sell out. If you haven't ordered one yet, we had a person in Michigan bought one, then he bought three. Then when those three people wore it in the office, they had to order 58 of them because people wanted the Future Looks Bright hat, especially during times like this because ain't nobody saying Future Looks Bright. To order your Future Looks Bright hat, click over here. And to watch the entire podcast, click here. Take care, everybody.